the fifth episode of season eight of the dark money files in which we shine a light into a murky world i'm ray blake and with me is my co-host friend and business partner graham barrow hello graham season eight fifth episode i oh, know hello ray mad isn't it now we're looking yeah. today at peer data Oh, you like peer data, or is it you like to peer at data? Well, but but either way, you do like it, don't you? Well, one of those things, certainly, Graham, and I'm not averse to the other, to be honest with you. No. Um, But why is that, Ray? Well, I think any MLRO will empathise with this, Graham. Um, One thing in quite short supply when you're an MLRO is reassurance that you're doing the right thing, that the systems and controls you're sitting on are, to use the magic words, appropriate and proportionate. Oh, well, yes, I get that. And as humans, the way we get comfortable with ourselves tends to be by looking at the people around us, comparing ourselves to them. If we're broadly in line with them, that's comforting. If we're an outlier compared with, well, the people we compare ourselves to, uh, that raises questions and doubts. Yes, and the trouble is that we work in a business, Ray, that's wrapped up in client and commercial confidentiality. Mm, I have a hard time getting a good view of what's going on in my own firm, let alone someone else's. And I think many people would say the same. If they knew, they wouldn't be quoted, Ray. Well, yeah, there's that. Hmm. So, as an MLRO, how do you overcome that difficulty, that, that discomfort? There are different ways, Graham. Uh, You'll often find MLROs are keen conference goers and in recent times webinar attendees. It's useful to take soundings and get insights from how other firms are approaching challenges. Okay, but that can be time consuming, can't it? Mm. And you can't necessarily get help on your own specific issues kind of in the moment. Uh, No, which is why many MLROs will have cultivated their own professional networks where on a regular or ad hoc basis, they can chat privately with counterparts in similar organisations and discuss issues. And this is probably where we need to mention Chatham House. Ah, the Chatham House rule. Uh, A marvellous invention. Do you want to fill in listeners not familiar with the convention, Graham? Well, yes, I will. And it's often erroneously referred to as the Chatham House rules, um, Mm. which I think is a people are... Mixing up with the cider house rules, oh, if yeah. I'm honest. Um, but, but they aren't rules. It is a singular rule. And it has been summarised in the following terms, and I'm quoting. The Chatham House rule helped create a trusted environment to understand and resolve complex problems. Its guiding spirit is share the information you receive, but do not reveal the identity of who said it. Uh, Yes, it's a framework for sharing information that all participants agree stays in the meeting and is not used outside the meeting to break confidentiality. It lets you describe enough detail about a situation to get useful advice and insight without having to worry that the people in the room will betray the confidence. But you would still take care to withhold the most confidential information, wouldn't you? Uh, Yeah, crucially, I'd leave out any identifying details and keep it all anonymous. So what you're describing then, Ray, is an informal forum, but increasingly there are official ones too, aren't there? Uh, Are you thinking of Jimlet, Graham? Well, yes, Jimlet is the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, a partnership between law enforcement and the financial sector um, to exchange and analyse information relating to money laundering and, and wider economic threats. The task force consists of over 40 financial institutions, uh, the FCA, CFAS, that's the Credit Industry Fraud Avoidance System, and law enforcement agencies, including the NCA, HMRC, and the Metropolitan Police Service. Yeah, so Jimlet was set up in 2015 as, a, frankly, a first-of-its-kind public-private partnership, and it has generated very positive results. And globally now, there are lots of LITs, SAM LITs, and all sorts of other LITs um, popping mm. up because it is being emulated um, uh, across the world. 
But if you're not in one of those 40 institutions, in the UK's case, Gimlet is of little direct benefit to you as an MLRO. Uh, there is, however, the FCA's reporting of rep crim returns. OK, now that sounds like a pretty awful scrabble rack, Ray. So, um, so what's that about? Uh, well, Rep Crim describes the data that authorised firms in the UK have to send to the FCA annually in a special return. It's used by the FCA to better understand the UK regulated financial services landscape. Uh, and in recent years, they've published summaries and analyses of the data that anyone can read. And why would people want to read it, Ray? Well, you've got a point, Graham. It's of, it's of little interest to a general readership, uh, but for an MLRO, it's a must-read, I'd say, because it gives you access to peer group data you'd never get in any other way. OK, I can see why that might be interesting. Um, but how would you use that as an MLRO? All sorts of ways, Graham. but let me give you a couple of examples. Go on, then. Uh, well, I'm looking after the anti-money laundering risks of uh, an investment management firm whose client base contains, let's say, 100 PEPs out of 5,000 clients. OK. Is that a high level of PEP exposure? I don't know, Ray, from that single data point. Would it help you to know how many PEPs a typical investment management firm has on its books? Yes, of course. Um, so can I find that out from the RepCrim data then? Uh, yes, you can. That will help you understand the relative risks of your business model so you can more effectively assess them in your business-wide AML risk assessment, for instance. Remember, all risk is relative, so without comparative data you can't really be confident that your analysis isn't a mile off. Well, now that makes sense. Hmm. How else can the data help you then? Uh, think about SARS, Graham. Uh, I know how many internal SARS are being raised to me and how many I'm reporting externally. Uh, from those numbers, can I conclude that I've got an effective system? No, Ray, you can't, because that's a single data point. You can't really conclude anything from it. No, but if I could look at those numbers across those of similar types of firm, I'd be able to see straight away if my numbers were broadly aligned with my peers, or if I was an outlier, wouldn't I? Yes, but, but I suspect that in reality it's probably a bit more complicated than that. Uh, you're absolutely right, Graham, and we might delve into that in a minute. OK, for now I'm convinced. I, I actually do need to read this. Um, can you preview some of what I'll learn when I do? Uh, of course, Graham. It would be my pleasure. Uh, the FCA published its second summary of RepCrim data in October 2021. Only its second, Ray? Uh, yeah, and this one is a bit of catching up. Two, uh, it covers the three-year period from 2017 to 2020. So when was the first? Uh, that came out in 2018, and at the time it was described as the first annual survey, so I was quite surprised that it hadn't followed an annual publication schedule subsequently. Uh, in fact, I wrote to the FCA earlier this year to ask what was happening, and they told me then that, quote, consideration is currently being given to publish another update this year. Well, I'm delighted that consideration yielded some fruit. Uh, well, me too. Uh, anyway, the new report is based on 5,685 submissions by over 2,300 different firms. Right, well that's a subset then of, of all regulated firms. I think the FCA supervise about 22,000, don't they? Uh, yeah, but only certain types of firm are required to do this report currently. Mm. Uh, we'll see who they are as we work through. OK, so uh, what's the first bit of interest? Well, we can start with the one I mentioned a minute ago, exposure to PEPs. Uh, the report shows where across the market there are particular concentrations of PEPs, noting, for instance, that more than a third of PEPs reported are concentrated within wholesale financial markets, with retail lending accounting for only 11% at the other end. Hmm. And are there numbers of PEPs and numbers of firms so you can calculate average exposure by sector? Helpfully, Graham, yes, there are. Well, that's just lovely. 
<laughs> I thought so. Uh, potentially less useful is a section detailing other high-risk customers, those that aren't non-EU correspondent banks or PEPs. So those that the firms have themselves identified as high risk for a variety of reasons. Yes, and there's the reason behind why this is of limited use to benchmark against. Because these are derived from relative measures of different risks and exposures. Indeed. Uh, It is noted, though, that the retail banking sector reports more high-risk customers than other sectors. Well, that at least makes intuitive sense. Retail banking Mm. affords opportunities to the money launderer that other sectors, well, don't necessarily. Mm. So, next we have an analysis of SARS data, and four simple stats are collected here. And what are those, Ray? There's the number of internal SARS, the number of external SARS submitted to the NCA, the number of SARS that were consent requests, and the number that were made under the Terrorism Act rather than the Proceeds of Crime Act. Uh, And that, I believe, is broken down over different sectors as well, isn't it? Yes, Graham, it is. If you employ some rudimentary uh, arithmetic, uh, you'll find out that typically UK reporting firms enjoy a two-to-one ratio of internal to external SARS. So if I've got you right, for Mm -hmm. every two suspicions that are escalated internally to the MLRO, the MLRO after investigation, of course, decides that one of those is genuinely suspicious enough to report to law enforcement. That's exactly it. So you'd then look at your own firm's ratio, I guess, wouldn't you, and see how you compare. But as we alluded to earlier, it's a bit more complicated than that. Am I right? Uh, You're right, Graham. The first point to bear in mind is a caveat made by the FCA when reporting these numbers, which is this, and I'm quoting, the difference between the volume of SARS reported to the NCA and the volume of SARS reported internally to MLROs varies greatly between firms within the sector, and this could be reflective of firms' differing risk appetites. Well, I see that, Ray, but that's only part of the story, isn't it? I don't think we can get insight from this report into how many alerts were raised initially and discounted earlier in the process before becoming internal SARS. Uh, Quite right, Graham. So I think we would be quite cautious about attaching too much significance to your variance or compliance with this simple average. Yeah, even accepting that though, Ray, I think your own ratio is worth considering. But because any firm has a unique set of financial crime risks and systems and controls and risk appetite and so on, any kind of peer comparison is going to be less useful than justifying your uh, your ratio on its own merits. It might be Mm. more useful to track changes in the ratio over time and understand what is behind them, or or at least to test a number of hypotheses. Uh, Such as what, Graham? Well, if your own ratio of internal to external SARS is wide, let's say it's more than three to one, Mm -hmm. are you worried that either staff might be too eager to report trivial suspicions or that as MLRO, you might conversely be too reluctant to file cases that really should be filed? Ah, That's a great question. Um, This report won't tell you the answer. Uh, What's another? Well, let's say your ratio is too narrow. Let's say it's less than one and a half to one. Are you worried that staff might be applying too high a bar to suspicion and not reporting things they should be? Or conversely, that you as MLRO are filing with too little investigation to resolve some suspicions that could be cleared? Uh, Yeah, and I think we both know trigger happy or trigger shy MLROs, don't we? Hmm. When you're compiling your annual MLRO report to the board, you are expected to comment on the adequacy and effectiveness of the firm's AML systems and controls. Now, in that context, these are the kinds of questions you want to be able to address and share your thoughts with the board. Yeah, and also, how recently have we trained all staff on what sorts of suspicions they should be reporting, when and to whom? Um... Has training had an impact on the numbers of reports? Yes, and maybe over time changes to internal policies and procedures and controls that might have an impact on reporting levels. Um, Absolutely. uh, And and then you might want to look at which departments are most and fewest reports coming from. Does that reflect where we expect to detect issues? Is that breakdown changing? And if so, do we understand why? But we digress, Graham. We do. Back to the Rep Crim report 
then? What else can we glean here, Ray? Well, the report moves on next to sanctions and a sentence that frankly surprised me, Graham. It's this, quotes, About two-thirds of Rep Crim submissions over the three reporting periods indicated that firms undertake automated screening against relevant sanctions lists. I think I can see what surprised you, Ray. Uh, what, what, what did the other third do? It's a question the report doesn't answer, Graham, but I'd, I'd love to know the answer. Um, it does, however, break down the distribution of firms that don't undertake automated sanction screening, and it turns out that whilst almost no retail banks are included... Oh, phew. Uh, well, very few indeed, Graham. Um, <laughs> in retail lending, wholesale financial markets, and especially in investment management, it's far more common for firms not to have automated screening. Well, that makes a kind of sense. You're talking generally about far fewer clients and payments that don't generally include third parties. Uh, yeah, I suppose that explains it. What is really useful here, though, is the number of true customer sanctions matches and of true payment sanctions matches. Well, yes, it's good to be able to see whether your systems are giving matches in line with peer firms. So is this broken down by sector two? Not directly, but there are some almost tantalising snippets that the FCA shares. They say, for instance, that for customer sanctions true matches in 2019-2020, that five firms contributed to approximately 90% of these matches, while retail lending contributed to about 70% of these hits, followed by retail banking at about 16%. And they also note that of the payment matches, five firms contributed over 90% of them, and retail banking, not surprisingly, contributed about 93% of the total matches. So, if I've got that right, some types of firm could sort of engineer a peer comparison from this. Yeah, I suppose so, but I think that firms wanting to determine the effectiveness of their own screening controls have got better ways of doing that through formal system testing. And that's a fair point, Ray. Now, there's a big chunk of the FCA report that looks at country risk, isn't there? Uh, there is, and it's fascinating. How so? Well, firms have to come to their own view of country risk and draw up a list of the countries where they perceive the threats represented are greatest. This will be a product of their own experiences, business models and, and countless aspects of what they actually do. Nonetheless, there are some interesting outliers here. Oh. Uh, well, yeah. The country most commonly identified among the surveyed firms as high risk is Pakistan. That appears in 385 of the lists. That's not that controversial, Ray. Uh, no, but that's more than three times as many firms as regards, say, Niue or Anguilla as high risk. More than twice as many as regard the US Virgin Islands, the Marshall Islands or Cyprus as high risk. Hmm. And there is one firm each that has identified in its high risk countries list Canada, Australia, Austria, Ireland, Spain and Finland. Do you think they might have misread the question. <laughs> well, maybe, Graham. Uh, there's no way of telling whether that's one rogue firm with a really weird risk experience uh, or several firms, each of whom uh, have named one of them. As you say, Ray, that is fascinating. Um, <laughs> What else is in the report? Well, the last couple of bits I found uh, interesting were the number of staff in financial crime roles, although that isn't broken down very far, so comparison to your own firm isn't that straightforward, uh, and customers exited and refused for financial crime reasons. Now, I always think that is a key indicator as to how firms are handling their financial crime risks. Yeah, how many customers or what proportion you turn away at onboarding or exit after they've become customers is a really telling statistic and one that you can measure over time. So... What can we learn from the Rep Crim report in this regard? Well, again, there's no detailed breakdown, but the FCA notes that the number of customers being exited has more than doubled in the last three years, and it gives figures for refusals as a proportion of all onboard candidates too. 
So in 2019-20, for example, 0.45% of all proposed relationships were refused. And that could be a useful yardstick for firms to compare their own numbers with, accepting all the limitations around business models, risk appetites and so on. Indeed. Uh, The last section of the report focuses on fraud and different fraud typologies. And I think we should let those who are interested dive into that themselves. I think most, though, will have access to industry trend information that's probably fuller and more recent. And I think that's uh, a fair comment. And there, we should probably commend the report to our listeners for further study. With one final thought from me, Ray. Mm. You you mentioned at the start that Rep Crim was an interesting scrabble hand. Well, Mm. I can offer you Crimper. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and bless you for doing so, Graham. No problem. Uh, what are we going to look at next, then? Well, you know, I think we should have a look at Companies House new advanced search and the capabilities and possibilities opens it opens up, and for a couple of reasons, Ray. Mm. Well, one, it's really good, but <laughs> two, I think it sets a standard that other business registers around the world need to think about, and I think we should explore some of those reasons in a podcast. Well, I'm looking forward to it.